From WLWT, this is Issues. Hello, welcome to Issues. I'm Jan Michelle Levin Kearney of Sesh Communications and the Cincinnati Herald. We have a whole lot going on. Uh, a little later, we're going to talk about, and actually to Michael's going to do this interview, about a new, uh, a new law to help caregivers. So a lot of you are caregivers out there. You're going to want to hear about that. We're also going to talk about a really interesting topic, how deaf children can learn to speak, and not just how, but why deaf children should learn how to speak. So that's going to be a really awesome interview. First, we're going to talk about Real men on board, and there, there, there's a conversation going on with dads now, and it's to prevent infant mortality. And so I'd like to introduce Beth McNeil, who's Associate Director of Cradle Cincinnati. Welcome. Thank you, Jan. Great to be here. Good to have you. And Justin Massey, who's a dad. Doing? He's got a beautiful little two-year-old daughter. We're going to see her picture later. And you were in the Real Men on Board class. Yes, You're a graduate. Welcome, both of you. How you Thank doing? you. I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Tell us a little bit, Beth about Real Men On Board? Real Men On Board is a co-creation with Operation Driven and Cradle Cincinnati, which is a part of Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And we are focused on balancing the equation in parenting. Because when there's a loss of a child, there are two parents that lose a child. We often focus on the mother. Um, and in maternal child health, most of all the laws and the regulations are built to support the mother. But we decided we wanted to focus on the other half of the equation and the men leading their families and taking on mutual responsibility in reducing infant mortality. Because unfortunately, Cincinnati is in the bottom for statistics for babies not surviving from first breath to first birthday. And that's, that's just so tragic. And, so, and you're going to show us later about some things we can do. Absolutely. Um, but Justin, so how did you get involved with the program? I heard about the program prior to one day it started. So that was amazing. Just one day before. Happened to be there at the right time, the right place. And you showed up at the Melrose YMCA? Yes, ma'am, with open, open arms. With, okay. And Beth, and you, you said you were really impressed because Justin came in and said, oh, I need to make a change. Justin was truly the model father. He came in very humbly, um, had not even registered, showed up literally at the start of the class. As he said, he was in the right place at the right time, and he asked what the program was about. He had heard a little bit, but he said, I need to be here. And 12 weeks later, um, he received our Fatherhood Award, and he has an amazing story around his own personal fatherhood journey. So, so being in the program helped you get visitation, mm -hmm. and tell us about that. It helped me with a lot of things. I were, it was at a point where I was giving up on a lot of things, looking for jobs. I was getting, made me feel like nobody wanted to hire me. And I couldn't, I was, wasn't seeing my daughter, it was going on eight months. So that was pretty hard for any father who can imagine. Oh, yeah. So at the time, I enrolled in the group. Instantly, I felt, I felt it. Like, oh, is this where I meant to be? Like, it was a topic, they stayed on topic, and they helped me. And throughout the 12 weeks, got a job, which I'm currently at now. Wow, good. Got to see my daughter more often, get to spend holidays with her. I wasn't spending holidays, and that was so hard, it was awesome. And those years passed fast, I uh, mean, yes, yeah. She's already two, her birthday just passed. Oh, wow, yeah. she's beautiful. We're gonna show her a picture in a minute. <laughs> yeah. She's a gorgeous little girl. That mm -hmm. is fantastic, congratulations. Thank you. Beth, tell us about what happens in the class. Um, Justin mentioned some topics. What, what kind of topics are there? Well, for 12 weeks, um, we have various subject matter experts from across the city who come in. So we have Beach Acres. We have uh, Greater Cincinnati Urban League does a phenomenal job for us. We tackle mental health and wellness and depression for men, which is very much a reality through a sound mind counseling firm. We're hosted at the Melrose YMCA. The men get YMCA memberships through oh, the wow, courtesy. Yeah. So we talk about physical health and wellness, but we also talk about how to talk to your doctor when you take the child to the doctor. Ask the doctor what you forget or a little embarrassed to ask when you're at the doctor. Right. And then we talk about fathering to reduce infant mortality. And we talk about safe sleep, we, yeah, show us what you have with us. This got is, really... there are a lot of myths out there about how to put your baby down to sleep. Okay. And what we always say is, it's this side up. I love that. Hold that out. So, so that's a little onesie. It's alone on your back in the crib. No so stuffed ABCs, toys around them. Yeah. No toys, no bumpers. And 
No um, excessive blankets because all you really need to do to put the baby down to sleep is, this is called a safe sleep sack. Okay. And believe it or not, baby's bodies generate enough heat that they are warm with just this and they're safe. So this is a safe sleep sack. It zips up, it's a blanket, and a onesie all in one. Oh, wonderful. And if you put the baby down with this, it's the safest way to put the baby down. So. And you want them on their back. On their back, And not have, stuffed toys are cute, but that, you know, babies can suffocate, so we don't want stuffed toys around them. We don't want the blankets around them. So. We say ABC, always alone on the back in a crib. Okay, Easy to remember. Not in your bed, yeah. Not in the, not bed, in the bed, no, no co-sleeping, not on the couch not on your chest when you're in the bed, um, because unfortunately, statistically, we see deaths where people roll over and the baby does not survive because right. the baby is not strong enough. Um, right. So ABC, how safest way to the, do it. For the, for the mm -hmm. parents, but how wonderful that you're teaching. You're gonna start going into churches, 40 churches, and talking to grandparents as well, because a lot of grandparents are caregivers. Yes. And Jeff said, let's give a number so people know. And this is a free class, Real Men on Board. People can mm -hmm. register at www.realmenonboard.org. Very easy registration. Five quick questions, and we will receive your information, contact you. Okay, and we'll link, link you through WLWT.com. Any phone number to call, or is there a phone uh, number? Website is the best way Website's to do it. The best way. Did, did we already show Justin's baby? Okay, we're gonna okay, we're gonna bring her picture up um, as soon as we get back. As Jeff says, we've got oh here she is. Oh there she is right there. Oh. Beautiful. I had um, is Jeff okay. We had caught this picture prior. I, was, I wasn't seeing my daughter when I just started seeing my daughter. I, around Christmas time, I ran to Josh. We were both doing Christmas shopping. He had a, uh, adopted a family, and Beautiful. I had my daughter of my own. Well, congratulations. Okay, stick with us. We'll be back in just a moment. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, she is gorgeous. Welcome back. I'm to Michael Bobo, and I'm here with Trey Addison, the Associate State Director of Advocacy for AARP. Welcome, Trey. How are you today? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for asking. Tell us a little bit about AARP. Yes, AARP, uh, I represent AARP Ohio. So we, in Ohio, we have 1.6 million members across the state of Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty significant. Obviously, uh, 50 plus population is who we represent. Even those who are not members, we still make sure we represent them at the state house. In my capacity, I manage all of our state government relations across the state. So um, AARP as a whole, we have about 36 million members throughout the country. So we are a, a very large constituency. Um, so we have a lot of power uh, because we have a lot of people. So that's, uh, it's a beautiful thing when you're advocating for a group uh, that represents so many individuals. Okay, what type of things do you advocate on the state level? On the state level, uh, healthcare is big. Uh, so caregivers, family caregivers and things of that nature. Also utilities is probably one of the larger issues for us. Um, and a lot of folks don't think about AARP and think utilities, but for us, we want to make sure that, the, that our members and non-members, folks who live on fixed income, are paying fair utility rates. So that's one other aspect. And then the last one is financial security. Uh, we, we do a lot around retirement and pensions uh, to make sure that when folks are, are at the age to retire, uh, they retire comfortably. Okay. You mentioned that um, there's a new law for mm -hmm. caregivers. Give us a little information about the yes, Caregivers yes. Act. Yes, yes. So AARP worked for about two years to pass the Family Caregiver Act, uh, which was, it was folded into House Bill 470. And what the bill does is it makes sure that hospitals are contacting loved ones uh, as soon as a, a family member is going to the hospital, so once they're getting admitted. And then it also makes sure that instruction takes place when that family, when that family member is getting discharged. So as soon as a family member is discharged, we, want to, we wanted to make sure that not only is a loved one contacted to say, hey, we're discharging your mother today, but here's an opportunity for you to come in and learn more about you know, what, 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 what care she may need. It may be a wound change. It may be something as simple as here are the medications. Are there conflicting medications? So it seems pretty simple. However, uh, and, and a lot of great hospitals do it. However, we wanted to make sure the entire state of Ohio was in sync and with this codified best practice to move forward that every time a loved one goes to the hospital, someone is being contacted and someone is being notified. 
And whose responsibility will it be to contact them? Do you have representatives in the hospitals or is it a responsibility of the hospital staff? Absolutely, it's the responsibility of the hospital. So in the hospitals, the way it works typically is they would have a social worker or a discharge planning nurse or sometimes with smaller systems, a doctor. And as soon as they admit the patient, that, that individual, the nurse that, or whoever's working with them may say, hey, okay, who's your family caregiver? One thing AARP is committing to is that all of our 1.5 million members across the state of Ohio will make sure, hey, we're gonna mail you a card. So we'll get a caregiving card. So whenever you go to the hospital, when you hand them over your Medicare card or your insurance card, you hand them over your, your, your caregiver card as well. And it has your loved one's information on the back. So as soon as that nurse sees that, they put that individual's name in the, in the EHR, in the electronic health record. So once that name is in the EHR, by the time they get ready to discharge the patient, they can immediately contact that, that person. It, it's similar to, um, I played sports when I was growing up, similar to emergency contact. My mom was always my emergency contact. My so, mom still is mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sometimes, you know, and now it's my wife. So if something uh -huh. happens to me, um, you know, when I was younger or even now, you know, now my wife is my caregiver if something happens. My mother used to be my caregiver when, when if something happened while I was playing football or something. So. Okay. And how do people get in touch and find out information? And also, is it something that is just for, you have to be an AARP member? Will other, how will other people get the information about their caregivers? Absolutely. One of the things that we're really, really going to look at is, is educating the general public not only AARP members. So yeah, you can say, oh, you guys got millions of members, great. They're gonna get education, they're gonna get the marketing materials, but we wanna educate everybody. Everybody in Cincinnati, everybody in Columbus, everybody in Cleveland, everybody in Putnam County, Ohio, it doesn't matter. Uh, we wanna make sure we're, we're engaging. So the big thing for us now is education. We passed the law, great, it impacts millions of individuals in the state. AARP supported the law, we fought hard, we got it done. Now it's time to educate the general public on it. So one way in doing that is partnering with hospitals, partnering with health systems, partnering with nursing organizations who have nurses that are gonna have to deal with this on a regular basis. So we'll partner with that and have our members involved and volunteers involved. So, you know, you can go to aarp.org backslash caregivers to learn more about what we're doing across the country. Uh, aarp.org backslash Ohio to learn more about what is going on in Ohio for caregiving. Okay, now let's get a number real quick. Um, can you give us that number? Yes, our number is 614-222-1516. Okay, repeat it one more time slower for Yeah, of course, 614-222-1516. 1516 and that is where you can contact us and learn more information about the law especially specific to Ohio as well as if you want any material on how to help your loved one and your caregiver uh, that you're dealing with. Great thank you so much Trey for being here today I'm sure a lot of people need this information thank you for educating them today we'll be we'll look at a moment in black history now right now. WLWT celebrates moments in Cincinnati black history. The Mann's Hotel was black owned in the early 20th century when lodging in Cincinnati was still segregated. Famous African American entertainers and musicians stayed at the Mann's when they came to town. Known for its ballroom and meeting place, the hotel still stands today in Walnut Hills as an apartment complex formerly owned by Horace Sudeth, who died in 1957. Welcome back. So we have a really special story, and this is um, from the folks at Ohio Valley Voices, and we're going to talk about how deaf children can learn to speak. So let me introduce Maria Centelic, who is the founder and executive director of Ohio Valley Voices. Welcome. Thank you. And Jasmine, who's only eight years old. Thank you for coming on today. She's just as pretty as you can be. We appreciate you being here. So, okay, Maria. So. 
you know, when we think about children who are deaf, I think the first thing we think about is, well, we, we need to teach them sign language, but you have a whole different view about that. Yes, we do. I mean, what I think is amazing is science. It's really all about science. Um, in 2000, we opened Ohio Valley Voices because of something called a cochlear implant. A cochlear implant is what Jasmine has. She has it right here on her head, and what that does is that is and a... I was going to say, you can barely see it. And so. I'm turning her just a little yeah. bit so you can show me your cochlear implant. What that does is that that microphone picks up sound and uh, analyzes it and then sends a message to the brain uh, and the brain interprets it as speech. And because of that, te that technology that really was passed in um, for children in 1994, then children were able to start getting cochlear implants as a surgery. It gave, uh, opened the doors to deafness because it gave children access to sound where they could learn to talk and talk just like you and I. I mean, Jasmine will, will sound, sounds just like you and I do. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's because of science and of intensive instruction. It takes a lot of instruction to learn to talk, to train your brain. It's really training your brain how to hear wow. um, and that's that gives them opens the door of opportunity for them they can interact like anybody else they can talk with everyone get jobs uh, learn to yeah, read tell us some stats because I understand mm -hmm. um, for deaf children the graduation rate from high school isn't as high and the college graduation yes. rate but it increases yeah. with the implants it's you know very unfortunate but if you if your primary mode of communication is sign language uh, the average deaf adult who uses sign language as their primary mode of communication only reads around the fourth grade level have a higher incidence of suicide depression divorce alcoholism and drug use and that's very it's wow. because it's very very isolating right. uh, you know we're on this earth at least I believe we're on this earth to communicate and connect with each other right. and when you minimize who you can communicate with and who you can connect with by using sign language it really it's it's depressing it's not you don't have to you don't get to connect with as many people um, giving uh, science giving us cochlear implants has opened the doors for deaf children and deaf adults um, that they can learn to talk and be a part of whoever whatever community they want to be a part of and I think that's a opportunity that is wonderful well Jasmine let me ask you about school how's school going for you good do you like it yeah. What do you like about school? Math. You like math? I love to hear girls say that. I love it when girls say they like math. So math is your favorite topic. Is it? Yeah. And is, is it fun? Is school fun for you? Yeah. You have a lot of friends? Yeah. I bet you do. Why don't you tell her today what is the special today about Ohio Valley Voices? What is going on at Ohio Valley Voices today? We're having a 100th day of school. You're kidding! This is the 100th day of school? That's a big celebration. That's going to be fun. What are, they, what are you guys all doing at school? We are going to be an old lady. You're going to, oh really? Mm -hmm. They're dressing up like old people, like 100 year old people. Oh aren't my they? goodness, that's going to be so fun. Oh, that's great. Well, that's, you know, it's wonderful, but let, let me hear your story. How did you get on this path? I mean, this is really different. Yeah, I think that um, I became passionate, and I'm passionate about Ohio Valley Voices without a doubt. I'm passionate about what's possible for children that are deaf. When I was a Peace Corps volunteer many, many years ago, when I was at, in Ecuador, I met my daughter. Uh, she was, at the time, two years old and profoundly deaf, okay. and I ended up adop adopting her and bringing her back to the United States, and I learned quickly that um, deafness was isolating, and that what she really needed was to learn to communicate. So I kind of started dedicating myself to finding ways that I can make sure that she could connect. And it came, became natural that um, in 1999, um, three fathers came up to me and said that they wanted to open a school for deaf children. And they, because uh, they themselves had deaf children, and they asked me if I would be interested in uh, helping them and getting that started. So I did, and I've never looked back. Wow. And I, and I want to say, you have children coming from all over the world, don't you? Yes, I am so proud of this. We have seven countries represented at Ohio Valley Voices. Jasmine Which is here. right here in Cincinnati. It's yes. like, it's what, what, what area would that be it's like? In Loveland. Lo it's, in Loveland. It's Loveland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jasmine here can uh, say, hola, Jasmine, como estas? Bien. You speak Spanish too? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're so smart. She is, and she's Beautiful deaf. and smart, and you love math. I love and she, it. So we have, uh, People, we have children from Saudi Arabia, from India, from all, all over the world. And these children can connect, not only learn English, but they're learning the, their language of their home, which I think is what, oh. again, to connect the families. It's really about connecting with your children. And, and for Jasmine to be able to speak to her mother in Spanish is just, I think, incredible that she can do that and that she's profoundly deaf. So Jasmine, your mom is from what country? Where's your mom from? Where's your mom from? She's from Mexico. Is she from 
Argentina, do you know? From Mexico. She's from Mexico. Okay, your mom's from Mexico. So Spanish is really her first language. Mm -hmm. Does your mom speak Spanish? Yeah. Does your, who else speaks Spanish in your family? My sister. Mm -hmm. And who else? Somebody else I know. Me. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that is so wonderful. So, you know, I'm thinking this sounds expensive, though. Oh, it is very expensive. Unfortunately, um, to make the, it's expensive because to make this work, you need a lot of time. You need four to five years uh, of intensive instruction, and you need a lot of people. So Jasmine has two teachers, and she has a classmate with uh, three other children. But there is help. There, there is. There's insurance that helps with this? Some insurance, but there's usually a gap. Um, you know, insurance pays very minimal okay. to what it means. Uh, the average cost of a child is $31,000 to come to Ohio Valley Voices. We have over 27% of our children are at poverty or below. Okay. Um, and you know, as we go off the air, so what I, I, you know, the point I'm trying to make is you don't turn, you don't turn children no, away. we will not so turn So you find the funding for them, and that's what I just really, that's the message I really want you to have. So mm -hmm. it's expensive, but funding is available. Do you yes. want to give people a, a number to call? Yes. Uh, Ohio Valley Voices number is 791-1458. There it is on the air, 791-1458, and we've run out of time. We're going to have to have both of you back soon. Hey, stick with us. We've got a Black History Moment. Be right back. Thank you. WLWT celebrates moments in Cincinnati Black History. Peter Humphreys Clark was an abolitionist, writer, and speaker. Born in Cincinnati in 1829, he was the founder and principal of Ohio's first segregated public high school for black students, Gaines High School. He authored one book telling of African-American service to defend Cincinnati during the Civil War, The Black Brigade of Cincinnati. So real fast, I want to tell you, Ohio Valley Voices Gala is March, March 4th. So you can call them, we just gave you the number. But here's to Michael with some community events. First up we have the beautiful Black Bride Expo, Saturday, February 18th, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at New Prospect Baptist Church, 1580 Summit Road. Tickets are $10. For more information, call 260-7312. Next up is Ragtime, recommended for mature audiences. It's a play um, February 23rd through the 25th, 7 p.m. at Walnut Hills High School, 3250 Victory Parkway. Tickets are $10. For more information, call 363-8400. Last up is another play, The Glass Menagerie, February 9th through the 25th, 7.30 p.m. at the Hoffner Lodge, located at 4120 Hamilton Avenue. For tickets and more information, call 888-428-7311. Yeah, that's the new Edgecliff Theater. That's going to be phenomenal. Mm. Okay, Ohio Valley Voices phone number 794-1458, 794-1458 for the gala. All right, we want you to have a great week. Stay safe and stay positive. <laughs>